morning. You ready to hear about mobility challenges in Mexico City? <laughs> so I am incredibly pleased to introduce Dr. Gersherson, who is not only a tenured research professor here, uh, but also is a very strong rock fan, it, with uh, <laughs> favorites being Blind Guardian. And I think especially for those of us who enjoy the outs outdoors, uh, he enjoys swimming and biking. And as you can tell, he has a lot of information about himself online. <laughs> but the reason he's here today is because of his wide variety of academic interests around self-organizing systems, complexity, cognition, artificial intelligence, and philosophy. Among, and among the intersection of that research is his research towards organizing traffic lights in order to, uh, sorry, self-organizing traffic lights in order to improve outcomes in terms of mobility and transportation. And with, without further ado, go ahead, doctor. Yes. Well, welcome, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I, I want to give a brief introduction to the problems we face in Mexico City and then to zoom in into mobility problems. Um, so. Throughout our history, we can identify three main revolutions, agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, and the information revolution that we are living. We could say that the first one dealt with the control of matter, the second with the control of energy, and the third with the control of information. And each of these has developed technologies and knowledge that has transformed the way in which we live in different settlements. So the first one made it possible to go uh, from a nomadic lifestyle to sedentary uh, and have the first villages and cities. And then the Industrial Revolution allowed the possibility for cities to grow to, to um, let's say, sizes that were not possible only with agriculture. And with information, now we're having globalized cities. So uh, we can see that uh, there has been an evolution of the settlements that our species has made uh, that is in line with these revolutions not one-to-one, one, but let's say first we, we had villages, less than 10,000 people, cities up to a million people, uh, and then metropolises, that these were already cities with an influence over our region, and mega cities that one rough definition is uh, those with more than 10 million inhabitants, and megalopolises, uh, he here we can see uh, the valleys around Mexico City, so let's say Mexico City is officially just this bit, and all the rest, it's other metropolises that have been swallowed their own little villages around. So this is Puebla, this is Toluca, Cuernavaca, Cuautla, and uh, up there is Querétaro. Uh, and you can see that th they're uh, integrating more and more and functioning as a whole, and becoming more and more in the interdependent. So, of course, this has advantages, but also poses several challenges. So a quick history of the settlements in, in this valley. Uh, around 500 BC, um, um, DC, uh, this city was one of the largest of the world, uh, about 125,000 inhabitants. In the seventh or eighth century, it was abandoned. And uh, I mean, people didn't abandon the valley, but suddenly there weren't so many people. There are different theories about why this city was abandoned. Uh, actually, we don't even know how this civilization was called. Teotihuacan is the name that later civilizations used to refer to them. Teotihuacan is, uh, it, it means the place where the gods lived because it was abandoned. And um, it, it was 700 years ago that the Mexicas arrived from the northwest of the country and settled in uh, uh, in, in this valley, uh, following the legend that they should find an eagle devouring a serpent on top of a cactus. And actually, Tenochtitlan means a place where there are the fruits of this cactus that uh, maybe you'll have a chance to enjoy. Uh, so that's why this symbol is in the Mexican flag and, and everything. And uh, 500 years ago, when the Spaniards arrived, uh, it was between 200 and 4,000 4, people, and their, their empire was about 5 million people, the whole region from the Gulf to the Pacific. Um, they, they were uh, controlling uh, a l large part of the country. And 
One of the technologies that they used was Chinampas, that if you go to Xochimilco you, or Tlahuac, you can still see today. It's an elaborate irrigation system, but still agricultural, but that allows, uh, let's say, uh, high yield in small uh, pieces of land. But of course, you depend on water. And th this is a map of the valley uh, around the time the Spaniards arrived. And uh, just this island is Tenochtitlan. And only the nobles were allowed to live here. But still, uh, there were already several towns that now are parts of the city. And um, I mean, many of the streets that exist today were traced by, by the Mexicas already. So this is Calza de Tlalpan now, Calza Mexico Tacuba, and so on. Um, so, of course, this poses challenges because, let's say, the, the city that grows around this edge is highly susceptible to earthquakes because, let's say, the, the, um, the ground is of a particular viscosity that it resonates with earthquakes. Um, then th this is a map of Mexico City. Let's say wh when the Spaniards conquered the city, they founded Mexico and they drained the lakes, uh, not so successfully because we had floods until the middle of the 20th century every year. Uh, one year it was so bad that the capital was moved to Puebla um, because let's say, the, the, the all the streets were flooded. And uh, you, you can see that it's rather small. So if you go downtown, this is the Alameda, which is uh, a big park. The Fine Arts Palace is somewhere here. And the Zócalo is somewhere here, the cathedral. Uh, so, I mean, it was relatively small throughout the, the, the colony years. So this is already 18th century. Uh, then in the 19th century, it grew but not so much. Now you can see here the Alameda. Uh, this is Con Condesa. This is, uh, th there was a hypodrome here. That's why it's called that way. This is Chapultepec Park. And this is Reforma Avenue. So th uh, th that was uh, around 1909, just before the revolution. And then in 1930s, uh, it reached already a million people. Uh, and in the next decades, the population duplicated every 20 years. So there were many reasons for this. There was immigration from Europe. The, um, the, there was a very high birth rate until the 1960s and 70s, about six children per woman. Uh, the infant mortality was decreasing, and also lots of migration from, from the country. So this was in 1943. Uh, you can see... We are somewhere down here now, but let's say um, the, the city was growing very fast. Uh, and this shows just the urban spots o on uh, different years. So 1950 it was like that, and now it's even more, more than this. And uh, I mean, it's like a huge increase. We could say that uh, in the last 20 years, it hasn't grown at the same rate. I mean, not exponential, but it's still growing, not so much because of uh, population, because let's say the, the population already reached its peak, the, the birth rate about 20 years ago. So right now in Mexico, there are more people between 10 and 19 years than less than 10 years old. Um, but still, like in Asia, much of the metropolitan growth is because of migration, not because of birth rates. So th this uh, satellite image of, of this of the region. So politically, this is Ciudad de Mexico, but you can see that uh, the urban sprawl. Uh, more than half of the population lives out here, and here in Toluca, Cuernavaca, Cuautla, um, where's Puebla? Puebla, Tlaxcala, Apisaco, um, Pachuca. I mean, it, it has, uh, each of these regions has grown considerably. And uh, just the, the limits are the, the volcanoes that limit the growth. But I mean, the, the, 
the population is overflowing in the sense that, for example, there's a, uh, another campus of the university in the north of Cuernavaca, and it's 80 kilometers, but uh, by the highway you, you do less than an hour. And in traffic, to go from here to downtown Mexico City, it can take you more than an hour. So uh, it's common that many people live in Cuernavaca and work in the south of Mexico City or the other way around. And the same in the west. Uh, here's Santa Fe, which is like the new business district. And it's I if you want to go, like for example, from Xochimilco somewhere here to Santa Fe, it will take you two or three hours by car, by public transport even more. So many people live in Lerma, which is the east of Toluca, metropolitan region, and then you just drive through the freeway. And they used to arrive uh, quickly to Santa Fe. Now not so much because there are so much people doing that. So uh, there are many problems in, in this uh, region and of course in other megalopolises in the world. Um, I mean, there's poverty, there's inequality, uh, there's pollution, there's water scarcity. Um, but uh, I, I will focus just on mobility. And let's say it's just one problem, but it's an extremely complex problem. We can identify eight different factors that contribute to, uh, to urban mobility. First is the need to, to displace yourself. So if you live in the east of the city and work on the west of the city, then that generates uh, a huge demand. And uh, a problem in Mexico City is that uh, there are very few uh, working opportunities in the east and in the north, and they are concentrated in the center and on the west and in the south. So that generates a huge uh, demand for mobility. Now with the pandemic, Many people were able to work remotely, but now it's kind of uh, worsening again the, the requirement to go uh, to your place of work physically. And um, second is uh, the, the timing. If everyone enters at the same hour, then you have peak hours or rush hours. And if you had flexible schedules, then people can decide at which hours they will travel and this kind of spreads out the demand. Uh, then there is um, the, the quantity of cars in the city or passengers in public transport. If it increases, then the quality is decreased. The capacity of the infrastructure is also important, but in some cases it can be counterproductive in the sense that if you increase the number of lanes on a, on a road, or if you build new infrastructure, like for example, a new metro line, you are basically generating new demand uh, for people using it. And in some cases, it could be even counterproductive in the sense that you are generating more demand than the one you are trying to satisfy. Um, you, you also have to, do to deal with the technology and infrastructure. I mean, if we, if we have better technologies, then we will be able to better manage uh, mobility. That's one of the areas that we focus on. Another area that we have worked with is with behavior. So how different interactions take place between drivers or between passengers in public transport, it, that can also help improve mobility. Another is simply the, the, um, uh, the society. Uh, in Mexico, there is still a big pressure for owning a car. It's seen like a uh, sign of success. Uh, and also, for many people, the alternative th there aren't other mobility alternatives. Uh, many parts of the metropolitan region, they don't have decent uh, public transport, so um, it's expensive, it's dangerous, uh, it takes lots of time, so many people will buy an old car, uh, and of course that's uh, problematic for the city. Uh, and finally, the regulation. In, in Mexico, we have uh, laws and rules for driving and for building and for everything, but they're not enforced. So, of course, this, this is problematic because uh, we have an unorganized growth of the city, well, of the metro metropolitan region. And, of course, this is not specific of Mexico. So, just to, to give you an idea of the tendencies in recent years, this, this is the population on the street of Federal, now Mexico City, and Estado de Mexico, which is like the part um, uh, around the north. I didn't include other states that are part of the megalopolises. But more or less the, the population growth has been linear. 
but the number of cars has been increasing exponentially. Uh, however, the infrastructure, the, this is the kilometers of streets, uh, the metro and the metrobus, which is our BRT system, they have increased sublinearly. And of course, this makes sense because there's simply no space so that they can keep on growing at the same rate. So of course, this leads to a worsening of, of mobility. There's less, less space for more cars, greater demand, uh, and, and of course, this is not sustainable. <laughs> so this video was taken in one of the metro stations, San Lazaro, just weekday morning. If you want to enter the train, you need to go through the window. And actually, this is the ladies and elderly section. So at the hour where you need highest capacity, you can't get in, you can't get out. The system collapses. And even when you have the infrastructure, it's extremely problematic. So okay, how do you change behavior? Because uh, this is self-reinforcing in the sense that uh, we can assume that most people don't like to push each other, but if you don't push your way into the train, you won't get into the train. So those are like the rules of the game. How do you change them? Uh, so this is the same station after an intervention we did. So people are organized in a different way. They queue and these queues go uh, up the stairs. And also you can see that we didn't import German or Japanese passengers that supposedly are more ordered than Mexicans. They're the same passengers, though, just that they're behaving differently. Uh, and what we did was inspire what was done in, in other countries like Singapore or, or Seoul and uh, other cities to, to install signs on the platform that basically indicate where the doors will stand and let's say, please leave this space free so that people can go out. Uh, and then just wait here. We didn't know that people would queue. Uh, and also we didn't know whether it would work because our platforms are much uh, smaller than in other countries, in other cities. Uh, but it, it worked. And not only that, but in s stations without the signals, uh, people started queuing as well. Because now that you know that there are better rules for your game, then everyone starts playing this new game because everyone benefits from that. So. <laughs> This was just a viral video I, I got from, from the internet because many people kind of had lost faith <laughs> in, in Mexicans and then they saw this whole, how, how could we change our behavior? Uh, and some people started speculating, well, if without changing the components of the system in the sense that it's the same passengers that were pushing each other to, to get into the train. Now they're organized, uh, maybe we can uh, build rules for interactions of other systems where we also cannot change the components of the system. So, for example, we could improve the educational system where we cannot change the teachers, but maybe by regulating their interactions we can improve education. Or we cannot change um, business people in the country, but maybe by regulating their interactions we can improve their economy. Or we cannot change politicians, but maybe by regulating interactions we can reduce corruption and improve governance. So um, some other work related to, to mobility has to do with self organizing traffic lights. And the idea here is instead of trying to predict when vehicles will reach an intersection, we have sensors and these basically uh, change the lights on demand. And like this, uh, they are able to adapt to ever changing demand. So, well, uh, the problem is that if you improve traffic lights too much, then that this might motivate people to use car more, and then this can be counterproductive. So, of course, if some city implements this, it should go along uh, with efforts to reduce or limit the number of cars on the streets. Otherwise, it can be counterproductive. So, uh, in these very abstract simulations for the same densities, there's a tradi traditional traffic light coordination called the green wave, and here is self-organizing traffic lights. Here they have maximum flow in the sense that all the intersections are being used constantly. Uh, and well, it has lots of benefits. With a PhD student, Jorge Zapotecatl, we 
uh, also evaluated this for autonomous vehicles. So we asked the question, what's more beneficial, self-organizing traffic lights or autonomous vehicles? And it turns out that if you have autonomous vehicle but traditional traffic lights, they will improve but just slightly because they get stuck in, in the traffic. And if you have human drivers, even when they're less, um, uh, let's say, the reflexes aren't so good, so they waste some time braking and accelerating. Uh, the, the improvement is greater with the traffic lights than with autonomous cars. If you have both, then that's even better. Yes? Yeah. Hello? Oh yeah. Yep. How good are the sensors um, also for pedestrians and bikes? Yeah. And uh, how expensive are they? Yeah. Um, th there are different sensors you can use for implementing these, and there's like an inverse relationship between precision and cost, but in any way, the costs have gone down considerably, so you could, uh, the, the cost for one intersection would be easily less than $10,000 uh, with sensors all over. Uh, I, I haven't followed recent technology, um, but a few years ago we were comparing between cameras that uh, basically count vehicles, approaching vehicles, not once they're already uh, stopped, and um, LIDARs, which is the lasers that autonomous vehicles use. Um, so th the leaders are a bit more expensive, but more precise. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we haven't checked. And you can also consider pedestrians and bikes and, and everything. Uh, and you can also give preference to public transport or to emergency vehicles, because the, the main algorithm behind this is basically that you give preference to the streets with greater demand. So if you have already a group of vehicles uh, approaching an intersection, they will trigger the green light before they reach the intersection, unless there's vehicles crossing and let's say they're in the middle of crossing, so they need to wait a bit. But if there are few vehicles, then th they need to wait uh, behind the red light for a bit longer, on, unless no one's coming. If no one's coming, then they just get the green light. But if, if there are more vehicles coming, then they wait, and then this increases the probability that they will form larger groups, so you're promoting the formation of platoons. So it's much easier to coordinate, let's say, instead of 100 vehicles, 10 groups of 10 vehicles. And these groups leave lots of spaces between them that other groups can use to, to cross, uh, uh, let's say, uh, efficiently. And you, you can consider an emergency vehicle or a priority vehicle just as a platoon, and then they can trigger the green lights, but without disrupting the rest of the traffic. So, so that's also an, uh, another benefit from this. And Going back to, to public transportation systems, we also use self-organization to regulate the, the interactions. So the theory tells us that if we minimize waiting times at stations by trying to keep regular intervals or headways, then you will uh, optimize the, the performance of the public transportation systems. But there's this problem called the bus bunching problem or the equal headway instability that if one vehicle collapses, this <laughs> creates a feedback, and then I it will uh, collapse the system. An alternative inspired by hand colony communication, I mean, the, the rule is very simple. Basically, each vehicle tries to keep similar time and distance with their neighbors. And like this, it's flexible, and we achieve super optimal behavior uh, because the theory was wrong. But anyway, <laughs> uh, this is a simulation. Uh, of a di diagram, so th the time flows through here, and um, a simulation of the first metro line in, in Mexico City. Uh, the, the black lines represent how the trains move in time. So when they s move to the right and don't move up, it means that they're at a, st at a station or they're stopped. So uh, let's say that there's a disruption of 15 minutes here, so without, uh, let's say with the traditional control, they, they all bunch up and then their service is restored and they continue all bunched up and they don't recover. Of course, this doesn't happen in reality. Let's say the, the controllers would tell them, okay, uh, move a bit. But w what happens with this algorithm without uh, re requiring any external control, there's an in interruption and the vehicles that are ahead try to keep the equal distance with their neighbors, so they will delay their speed so that there's not such a huge gap between them. 
and when the service is restored, it very quickly, uh, let's say, goes back to, it, to its performance. Because, of course, the problem here is that this first train will be overcrowded because all the people were gathering here uh, at these stations without service. Is that the earthquake alarm? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, just to, to summarize, there are many different solutions that we can propose and none of these will solve the mobility problem. So we need to reduce demand, increase capacity, regulate interactions. Um, and let's say with many projects in parallel, we will be able to improve. And of course, the question is whether uh, the situation will worsen faster than we can improve it. So for example, uh, if it takes, I don't know, five years to build a new metro line, but you would need a metro line every two years to just keep up with demand, then your mobility is getting worse year by year, even when you are building new infrastructure. So, uh, I mean, the, there are some lessons that we can learn from the pandemic, and also w from our experience, uh, the technology is not a problem, but the human factor is. <laughs> in the sense that uh, these complex problems involve several actors. So you have the government, and you have the society, and you have uh, academia, and you have the private sector. Uh, and if you ask anyone, oh, should we improve mobility in Mexico City? Yes, everyone is agreeing. But then when you say, OK, let's do this, then everyone has different priorities. Politicians are worried about the next election, or just about let's say, keeping up with the service, f with the day-to-day, -day, they are completely overwhelmed. So uh, let's say this limits uh, innovation in many ways. Um, so, I mean, there are many things that can be done, uh, but in many cases, the, the obstacles are, um, let's say, simply how to coordinate between, between people. So just, to conclude, I, I wanted to, to share about a completely different project. Well, not completely pro uh, different, but um, it doesn't have to do with mobility, but using artificial intelligence to detect tax evasion. So one of the <laughs> features of, of Mexico is that uh, there's, let's say, our development is such that we have still lots of corruption but we are advanced enough that we can digitalize many things. So I, I think very few countries like Mexico or Chile are in this situation. Um, so since 2014, it's obligatory for all taxable transactions to be done through the, our equivalent to the IRS uh, website. So they have a huge database with all the transactions that have been made for, for taxation purposes. So, uh, there are many different ways of uh, evading taxes. Uh, and one of these is with fake invoices. So let's say uh, I go with a company that makes these fake invoices. I say I need to deduce a million pesos and they give me an invoice for a million pesos for a service that never existed. I declare I spend this ama amount that I didn't spend and then they, I, I don't pay the taxes for that. So it's a whole network that, that uh, of people and or organization that uh, evades taxes this way. And uh, th yes? Uh, just looking at the visual, what do the red, blue, and yellow dots represent? Yes, so, so this is a network of uh, taxpayers. The, the red nodes are those that the, the Mexican government already identified as tax evaders. And l let's say they are linked by who gives invoices to whom. So, if so, for example, here you can see uh, this tax evader, uh, well, fabricates tax invoices. It gave invoices to all these people, and we we don't know who these are. Well, we don't know who anyone is. It's all anonymized data. But then this one is suspicious, and you can see that it's giving invoices to the same people. So it's probably the same organization. They just have different companies. Well, they have five or more, ten companies. And then they gave invoices from all of them, and then they gave invoices from company to company, so that also they don't pay taxes. And uh, usually also they, they shut down the company, so w once the government detects this one, this cannot make invoices anymore. 
but it's very easy just to create a new company and start giving invoices to the same clients. So th this, this is a very easy way of detecting, uh, let's say, similar operations because you just have the same clients. You, uh, I mean, with, with your eye, you could detect it. But there are like more than 80 million taxpayers between people and companies. And we got a database of 700 billion transactions for four years and a list of just less than 10,000 uh, tax evaders. So with that, we use deep neural networks, random forests, and network categorization to, to classify suspects. And uh, so we gave a list to the government <laughs> of anonymized uh, taxpayers and say, well, these are highly suspicious because let's say the, uh, all the different methods suggest that they are also, th they have similar statistical properties as those of that you already detect as tax evaders. And uh, I mean, they, they didn't tell us explicitly, oh yes, w we found this and this and this, but in the few months after we delivered these results, uh, many large corporations started um, kind of getting their affairs in order. <laughs> so in the news there was like, well, I don't know, this soccer team paid, I don't know how many millions that they hadn't paid, or this company paid this amount of million pesos that they hadn't paid. So, um, well, just one example of s some things you can do with, with current technologies. So, I, yes, uh, we have time for questions. Going back to, uh, my name is Matt, thank you so much. Um, going back to the AI and transportation, you touched on it a little bit, but how do you think about solving current problems versus solving for the future and that trade-off? You talked about autonomous vehicles. There's still you know, a promise waiting to be filled, um, or even Uber, or sort of the, like the private sector interventions to some of these public infrastructure problems. Yeah, I, I, I guess you, you have to face both because uh, I mean, you, you cannot focus just on the immediate because otherwise when the future will <laughs> catch you up, uh, you, you won't be prepared. And of course you have to attend the immediate needs because otherwise, let's say, the, you won't reach <laughs> the future that you are expecting because things will break down beforehand. So, so you need to do both. Uh, I can see that. I can see that you referenced a lot of academic papers in your presentation slides, so I want to better understand what are the relationships between academia and the government. So does the government have their own research team or do they support academia or just apply the research from the academia to apply in the real world? Yes, it's a very complicated relationship. So uh, for example, for the Metro project, it took us two years and a competition between CONACYT, which would be the Mexican NSF, which was funding a small project. Um, so to, to, to put the, the signals in the, in the first metro station, it costed, um, wh what was the cost like? I don't know. Uh, yeah, like a thousand dollars. But still, it, it took us like the bureaucracy to get those thousand dollars and then we went one late at night with students and enthusiasts we went and stick all of them uh, uh, and it was a competition of bureaucracy between the university the government and the metro <laughs> to, to see who can delay things more and in other projects so for example we we attempted to to have a pilot study of the self organizing traffic lights here, here in the UNAM campus, you, you might have seen that there are a few traffic lights. So we contacted the company that installed and controlled these traffic lights. We had funding from the city government, and there, in that case, the, the weakest link was the university. <laughs> we never got permission from the university to, to, to access the, the traffic lights, even when we had almost the funding and the cooperation with the industry. So I, I think it's something that uh, we still have to figure out. Um, there are many people who organize forums precisely to promote cooperation, but at the end you just have a list of uh, good intentions, but let's say uh, achieving real projects is difficult because of different timescales that uh, organizations have. 
Um, so for example, in Mexico, there are elections every three years or every f six years. So politicians, if, if, if the elections are already coming, they won't start new projects. They're kind of more interested in seeing what will be their next political post or um, um, also in, in some cases the budget is finished and uh, also companies in Mexico don't have so much access to invest in research. So it, it, it's highly problematic even when you could say, oh yeah, there are a few success stories. Uh, there, there are many more cases of, of simply failures because of lack of coordination. Actually, uh, this is actually a quick follow-up to Soyun's uh, question. Um, one of the common themes of, uh, of our trip here is systems leadership in terms of how different actors can kind of move in concert or address different parts of the problem. You just kind of talked about some of the challenges yes. of getting them together. Having worked on a number of different projects in this space, even if they weren't entirely mobility related with respect to tax evasion, how do you see the role of kind of like the governments, whether it's federal or city, kind of private businesses and academics? Like what do you, f how have you seen like them work most effectively across like the different projects that you've been a part of? Yeah, I, I think if we start with common goals, that, that can easen the interaction because uh, for example, uh, th this last self-organizing algorithm for public transportation, I spoke with the director of Metrobus, which is our BRT, and in one of the lines they have everything ready to, to try this algorithm. Um, and in theory that could improve service by 20% or something like that. Uh, and he's like, well, yes, but then we have to speak with the drivers and they have union and al also in, in the buses that are here on campus, they also have a dedicated lane we could uh, implement this and I've been like, I don't know, 10 years trying to <laughs> to convince, but then the union says, okay, but if we do this, then you have to pay us more. Uh, and it's like things that you say, th this shouldn't be a problem, but somehow it is. Or also with the previous director of the Metro, before she took office, we had ideas of, okay, how to regulate uh, in the very busy stations like Pantitlan, how to regulate the crowds of people transferring stations and uh, we were like, okay, yeah, we can do some simulations, but we need, I don't know, a, a bit of money to hire some people to, to do this. And it's like, no, we don't have money. Uh, and it's like, okay, we can find some students and maybe they will leave, but okay, let's start. Let, let's just try to do something. Um, and she was like overwhelmed just because the service was in such a bad shape that she, uh, like her full day was filled just by getting the trains out of the workshops and, and running every day. So that, that's also another problem. I, if you don't have enough resources, not only monetary, but uh, let's say it's quite common that governments don't have enough personnel to, to run their normal operations, so they, they don't have the access to explore new possibilities and collaborations. So that's also a, a limiting factor. Yeah, hi, um, my name is David. Thank you, thank you so much for your talk today. So um, I have two questions. One is on the same point of working with the private sector. Um, could you describe some of uh, the working relationship with tech companies? So for example, I, I heard that Uber works in Europe with like, you know, the Paris government and all that to provide real-time data on the mobility of people and that helps to, um, helps with let's say even planning of like future roads and, and subway stations. And then the second part of the question is, how do you finance some of these projects? And is it possible to, for example, capture the increasing energy efficiency or productivity and use that to sort of like, you know, create the budget for, for these projects? Yes, uh, I, I don't think there's like a single answer because well, different projects got financed through different means, but mainly uh, just by being here in, in UNAM, which is, uh, government university, so it's financed by the government. It's a big investment by the country. Students don't have to pay to, to study here. So basically, uh, we have 12,500 full-time faculty, and uh, basically we can have the freedom and the space to, to do research on, on whatever we want. So in principle, we can invest our time, but then if we need to buy some extra things, 
then we can find some funding f from within the university or from government, but let's say it's, it's scarce as, uh, uh, everywhere. And in, in cooperation with, with companies, it, it varies because, for example, um, in 2014, we got some funding uh, from Audi. They had this Audi Urban Future Award, so there was a competition between Boston, Berlin, Seoul, and Mexico City. Uh, and they gave us some funding to develop a project uh, to improve mobility in our cities. And, uh, well, we won. So, <laughs> uh, which actually maybe we, we have to thank because having the city such a bad mobility, it was easier to, <laughs> to suggest improvements. Um, so, so, but of course, uh, there was an interest from Audi because they were opening a new plant in Mexico <laughs> uh, ar around that time. So it was also like good PR. Uh, but I think there's nothing wrong, wrong with that. Now we are seeing whether we have uh, a project with Didi uh, on how to improve mobility in Mexico City with their data the, that they have. Uh, and of course you can say, well, the, the companies will try to see a benefit from it. Would like, yes, but if everyone can benefit, then why, should, why shouldn't you collaborate with them? So, uh, I mean, I, I I think they're very individual cases, so I wouldn't be able to generalize to say, well, companies are good at doing this type of investments, or this is the way that we should motivate companies. But it's something that we desperately <laughs> need, like a formula to how to solve problems together through different sectors, because the problems that we're facing are so complex, not only mobility, pandemics, migration, economies, and so on, uh, climate change, that we won't solve them from academia, nor from the private sector, nor from governments. We need to work all together. And the problem, and it, wa it was quite evident during the pandemic, is that we don't have the proper coordination mechanisms to achieve this. So. <laughs> <laughs> the queue has been uh, somewhat disrupted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't, I don't have a very loud voice. Um, my name is Zoe, and I come from France. I have one anecdote and one question. Uh, the anecdote is I have uh, a couple of friends working in the applied research department of the French metro um, company, well, it's government-owned in Paris, and one of them was trying was it was a similar project to the metro project trying to increase the throughput of metros uh, for one particular line and he determined that with these old trains that can't brake or accelerate very fast uh, you need to have a more stable speed so it would be nice if the drivers could regulate their speed a bit more um, like less extremes yes and then um, he gave his research paper to the to the company and then they were like, oh, but we can only communicate with drivers through these traffic lights, like red, yellow, and green. And so green is go, red is stop, and yellow is <laughs> slow down. So you can't really regulate your speed very finely. And so they never implemented the project um, because of very like raw infrastructure problems, not, yeah. So it made me think of that. Um, I have a question which is about the traffic light problem. I was just curious. How how do you solve the problem if there's one big major artery w and so that always gets the green light and if I w if I need to go the the opposite direction I'm always gonna get a red light and I'm gonna get super frustrated with this <laughs> just uh, yeah how do you solve that case yes uh, you, uh, about your anecdote yeah it's one example of the slower is faster effect in the sense that uh, it is known that if the cars don't go let's say too fast, basically if th th that leads to higher variance, and that applies also to vehicles, uh, th that will lead you to, to jamming. Uh, and if they all go slower, then they kind of all move together and, and at the end they go faster because they don't have to stop. But yeah. uh, and about, uh, let's call it this asymmetry in demand of different streets, uh, the, the algorithm uh, kind of works around it uh, naturally 
in, in the sense that on average, yes, the, the vehicles on the small street will wait for longer time, but not longer than with traditional traffic lights. That That is a problem that you can wait like three minutes and then there's already a huge queue because the green light is so, so short. So, so you will have to wait, I don't know, 15 minutes to, to cross. Um, so let's say it kind of balances the waiting time of all vehicles and also uh, for high densities, if uh, let's say the traffic is such that you cannot cross the intersection, then they, they will put a red light on that street so that others can cross. Uh, and if no one can cross, it just puts red lights everywhere so that the intersection doesn't get blocked. So uh, w with this algorithm, you can have densities of more than 80% where basically there's no space to move, but still there is some flow because um, because of this rule. Uh, only that visually it's no longer like cars moving in, in the direction of the streets, but spaces moving in the opposite direction <laughs> of the street because it's like a space moving behind and everyone is, is stopped. So, so yeah, it, it can address that asymmetry. Um, thank you. I have two questions. One is the general public's interest in this topic. You mentioned that election plays a big part in how these projects are run. So I'm wondering how big of a concern mobility is for the general public. And my second question is around changes after COVID. So I would assume that people will have different uh, modes of transportation or demand for transportation. So how are you seeing the change in the demand and what kind of actions or different things is, are the players in the mobility space thinking of addressing this issue moving forward? Yes, well, well mobility, it's uh, always gets a, a very broad response because we are all affected by it. I mean, if, if you breathe, then you're affected by <laughs> mobility uh, because of pollution. Uh, so in many, many talks I give, we end up almost like a collective therapy because people start telling their anecdotes like, oh yeah, I was once uh, stuck in traffic for three hours. And <laughs> uh, I mean, it's something very personal, uh, as opposed to some research that have to do, I don't know, with astrobiology or with uh, molecular biology that it's, let's say it might seem distant for, for most people. Uh, so it also gets a very broad media coverage uh, and well, that's a positive thing. Uh, and about the changes after the pandemic, uh, like in many other cities, in several Mexican cities, including Mexico, uh, in the first months that, let's say, we didn't know exactly what were the risks of going by public transport, many people decided either to buy a car or to, um, or to use uh, s uh, a bicycle. So many cities built uh, tempor temporary infrastructure, uh, let's say pop-up bike, bike lanes. Uh, and in Mexico City, they, they did a couple of these. And in many, like in many cities like Paris and London, some of these bike lanes were made permanent. So in, in Surgentes Avenue, there, there's one, it's like 14 kilometers each side. And, um, uh, and the, the thing is that I would say that it's not enough. <laughs> we, we need much more cycling infrastructure. And of course, th I, I, I mean, the Minister of Mobility, he's in favor of cycling infrastructure and also the sub-minister. And uh, I, I mean, I, I, I know, uh, I, I have spoken with, with them, uh, but they also have different restrictions because when they have tried to make some cycling lanes in some parts of the city, then the neighbors are all against it. Uh, so uh, I, I think that in some cases it improved because now we have more cycling infrastructure, but in other cases it's getting worse because there are more cars on the streets because people don't feel safe in public transport. Still, because of requirements, the public transport is used uh, a lot. I, I wouldn't be able to say that we are back to normal in order to say, okay, now we can say that less people or are using cars for public transport. Many people are still doing things remotely. Um, but, but yeah, the traffic is almost as bad as it was before the pandemic. Um, so, uh, Dr. Gershenson, thank you for your time. We know we, you have a class to get to, to teach at uh, 10. So I just wanted to give you this quick opportunity. Um, 
given that many of us, we might be coming from international backgrounds, but we're spending quite a bit of time kind of in the innovation ecosystem of Silicon Valley, it's easy to look at a lot of these problems from sort of that kind of like technical advancement lens. I, I know I'm personally guilty of this as an engineer. I'm curious, if there was a takeaway or key takeaways when addressing these mobility questions, either in the US, here in Ciudad Mexico, or in a lot of our home countries, what would that be? Well, technology can help, but in many cases, uh, the problem has a different source or, or the largest problem uh, has to do basically with demand. If people have to move from one place to the other, then you need to solve that problem. If they don't need to move, <laughs> then there's no problem. So I in some cases, that thinking out of the box would involve uh, not so much how to solve a problem, but how to dissolve that problem or how to change it. So that, let's say, uh, of, of course, you don't have that problem anymore, but not by kind of just hammering and destroying it, <laughs> but by not necessarily exploiting it, but uh, going around it. All right, thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, Dr. Gitschenshin, thank you so much for your time. A huge round of applause once again for him. <laughs> well, I know the group had more people had questions for you since this was an extraordinary session and you definitely learned a lot, but I am conscious of time and you have to te have, you have a class to teach at 10 a.m. So thank you very much. One logistical announcement in terms of next steps. Um, we have coffee outside, so take a few minutes, uh, use the restroom if you need to get some coffee, and then we're gonna start the campus tour. Um, I would say in around five to 10 minutes, if that's okay, but we will reconvene outside uh, the space that you just saw where they're serving coffee. So thank you very much, Dr. Uh, if you have more questions or want to know more about this, just send me an email and, and we can continue from there. <laughs>